that don't get built. If you want to just weigh new urbanism compared to your drawing, new urbanism has more presence on the earth than your drawing. Yeah. But all these critics that say it's fake and whatever, or that it's too neat, or the urbanism is too neat, it's fake, you can say immediately they haven't visited. You haven't been to see any, have you? Yeah. Because this isn't even neat. How many architects? Yeah. Vince, who are the architects? How many? Uh, we probably had over a hundred um, designers and architects. Over See, the that's course, a so. huge difference. Yeah, of course, years, twenty-six builders. You guys builders. have a few architects. It's, you know, in England, yeah. in general. Yeah. We've had uh, twenty-six builders over the years. And it's very, very, it's very. You maintain higher. For example, if you look at a Prince of Wales town, there may not be something that low quality. It's a generally high, like celebration, it's a generally higher quality. But the diversity is false diversity. Because it's the same firm trying to yeah. trying to achieve diversity, which is almost impossible to do. And that might be wrong three different ways. But you know, but it's also what makes it real. And one of the things that we were noticing about generally there's a kind of imperfection to the to the front back and the imperfection to the detailing of the alleys which is what makes it real, like there's slack, and at least the DPZ towns have a lot of slack. There's a lot handed over to local interpretation, sequential engineering, while a lot of the, for example, the Tory Gallus's and certainly the Bob Stearns, they're always perfect, they're really perfect. And that, doesn't, that doesn't work for urbanism. Well, what you were saying about um, what Leon did with Creators, or what, yeah, what Leon did with Corbus, Design and make it less rigid, yeah. and that's how the low country is. It's yeah. Informal. Yeah. So, I mean, we would even make it more so if we could. Yeah. But, uh, and look at the trees. Just look at the spacing of the trees. There's a lot that's opportunistic, you know. There's a dead, you know, you know that that dying palm tree has not been removed. You know all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't. They didn't pull out like so many of the developers. If I remember right, you, you tried to save as many trees as you could here, or was that I was on the nothing? Is an expert I can't remember. Uh, Way back. Hey, Gibson. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, we, see, well, we, we lost you. Saved all the big ones that we, uh, we worked around. Them. Well, okay. yeah. Just, um, these are all planted, or most of these are planted. When, when were these planted? Yeah. 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 These yeah. were all yeah. live oaks, and yeah, they were planted. This this street was probably built maybe 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But I just, you know, I know so many developers that come into a forest and they'll just level everything and then plant the little stick trees. A lot of oaks will grow pretty fast if you take care of them. Right. But they'll be, you know, in another 10 years, they'll be blown out this curve and, you know, make the street buckle, the sidewalk, which I kind of like. Yeah, yeah. People are already freak out about So you're seeing the traffic probably at its maximum. This is also the widest street, the widest street type. Here's another thing. Here's another thing that's also that's also intolerable. People go to Kentland and they go at 10 o'clock and they say nobody's walking, or they go at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday or 3 o'clock in the afternoon and nobody's walking. Go to New Orleans at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, or go to a Charleston at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The residential areas, nobody's walking. So they yeah. hold us to a kind of mythical standard. Yeah, that in Renew time. Yeah, exactly. It's absolutely dead. Go to Edinburgh Amsterdam. Town. And the, you know, I was there in Amsterdam. You know, nine o'clock on a weekday morning, the center of Amsterdam. Yep. It's quiet. Yeah. Yeah. There aren't. I mean, so you, so you we're always being judged like against this TV. mythical. It's they who have the American small town with, you know, leave it to Beaver walking down, and you know, it's they who believe in their own stupid rendering. You know, with the with the, with the fake figures. And they used to get say, "Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, people aren't walking; they're actually working." But then, even in the in the holiday towns, like go to the Garden District in New Orleans, go to Marigny in New Orleans, go to Bywater in New Orleans, go to our walk yesterday. The walk we took, not the other two. Oh, I'm sorry, we were we were in a different tour. Yeah, I didn't see anybody. Not once. Okay, just a sense of scale. Have a look at the map. Because everybody misunderstands scale. We've just walked one block. Okay, the town center, right like that. We're looking, we're basically looking down at this street. 
which is a future area not yet permitted. And then we're about to cross a, a wetland system. Well, no, this three, this here, that's that. That's that, yeah. But that's permitted. There, I'm no, no, there. No, you know, it's. Oh, there. Yeah, this is not yet. They're fighting us on it. So believe it or not. Well, wait this. a minute. There's. Well, there's here's a house the, in the way. It, this is built now. This is what. Um, this is the as-built plan on the back. Where so is the this first stuff? one, the, the, this was the charrette plan that Anderson Victor Sperm did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. These are some, on the second page, of some Charles Barrett renderings of what we did not get approved. Um, then the 97 plan that yeah, was approved. Oh, it's up here. And then the as-built plan is the color one on the back. This is so what you're looking this for. It's built. Yeah, this is this is. Yeah, this, this, this area here in green that Andres is pointing to is our long sought for connection to Mirrorhead Road that we've been, we had to compromise out to get approved. There is a connection down here, under some of the lower yeah, left yeah, yeah. to the adjacent neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. But this is the one that's, and and that's the one you're trying to develop portion of the property. But we're about to cross a green, you know, basically a wetland, the, the rookery. That's right. This is a, that, see. that wetland is uh, the tail end of a saltwater creek in the Lassus Creek, but and then you see a river. Sense of scale, right? we had a pretty long walk, right? We walked from here to there, that's all. Yeah. Okay. This one didn't have any hiccups in terms of architectural quality. Okay, because, you know, it just came in a well, very, very... Well, that's generous. No, but really, usually they start, you can actually trace the first halting steps. And, and the other, the first time new urbanist developers, they figure it out. But there's always a, there's always some shaky stuff at the beginning, and this one doesn't have that. You know, just figure it out before. Well, that's generous of you to say. This is a, we're a couple of phases, three phases, and here we'll go over to the first phase and see where we started. Basically. Okay, here's a paid pedestrian coming with a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and Q. <cute. laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Out the work actor. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, let me explain a little bit about, about the trip. Um, I was asked to come here and start designing this church about ten years ago, um, and that's a Eastern Orthodox church design is a specialty of mine. Um, I was not Orthodox at the time, but ultimately my wife and I decided to convert to Orthodoxy and join the parish once we started working with it, and that's how we ended up settling in Charleston, is because we wanted to stay here and help get this church built. Um, and as a result, I ended up having a very close hand in the actual construction of the building. So all of the concrete columns and capitals that you see inside now, I, I sculpted those myself, the carving on the doors, um, a lot of the woodwork in here. Um, I did, I made all of these steel chandeliers um, because we did not have a, we really did not have enough money to build a building like this, so we all you know, had to pull together and do what we could to make it happen. Um, and it took about two years to build it, working rather slowly, you know, again, in part because of, because of the money. Um, and the construction of the building is, for the most part, concrete block two blocks thick, so all of the exterior walls are 16 inch thick, two wide of block, all ground and solid, um, and then there's cement stucco directly on the outside, and a lime based plaster directly on the inside of the block, and the plaster is a plaster manufactured by the Keim Mineral Coatings Company from Germany, um, and it's, uh, it's very thin, it's less than a quarter of an inch thick right on the block. And it's a formulation that's specifically designed for painting murals on um, using the silicate, techni silicate paint technique, which is the very same kind of paint that was used to paint um, Neuschwanstein Castle and all of the other Lake Victorian buildings in Germany that are all painted on the outside. It's a, it's a waterproof imitation of true Italian fresco. And that's what these murals are painted with. And then the ceiling surfaces of the church are framed in wood um, with lath and plaster, so it's a, it's a wooden dome. And, and the iconography was painted by a Russian-American living in California, um, Dmitry Shkolnik, who did all of the iconostasis panels. Um, what I did is I made the panels and the parts in the workshop and shipped them to and sent them back. Subsequently, he came with two other assistant iconographers, one from Russia, one from the Republic of Georgia, and we set up scaffolding, and they spent three weeks painting the app. 
house. And as money becomes available, we're going to paint the rest of the church, the dome next. And you're seeing a very unusual sight liturgically right now, which is that all of the doors on the iconostasis are open. The reason for that is that yesterday was Pascha, the Easter on the Orthodox calendar, and it was a, it was a liturgical tradition in Orthodoxy that the week after Easter is called Bright Week, um, and to symbolize that the gates of hell have been trampled down and heaven and earth are completely united um, by the resurrection of Christ, the doors are left open, making the altar completely visible. So an Orthodox church likes, looks like this only this one week of the year, only the doors will be closed. Does anyone have any questions? Well, first I wanted to say it's fabulous. Thank you. Oh, no, it's not modeled on a specific building. Um, stylistically, it's, it's a blend of different strains of Orthodox tradition. Particularly on the outside of the church, I wanted it to look like an Orthodox church that was comfortable here in Charleston. So I tried to identify features of Orthodox architecture that are consonant with features of traditional Charleston architecture. The sawtooth cornice on the outside is one of those. You see that downtown, and you see it on Russian and Green churches. Um, the stucco exterior, the bright paint color, the copper roof. All of these things kind of pushed it in a direction of 19th century Russian architecture on the outside. And I, I had a bit of a historical fantasy that I was thinking about. What would it look like if a 19th century Russian Orthodox church had been built in Charleston? Um, and it's not historically impossible because, for instance, in San Francisco and New York, there were Russian Orthodox churches built around the turn of the century. So had there been Russian immigrants in Charleston, they might have built a church here, and I imagined what would it have looked like. Um, and so with the, with the mixture of onion domes and the large dome at the center, the copper roof, the bright paint color, all, all of this is typical of, of St. Petersburg architecture from the 19th century. Um, the inside, we wanted to have much more classically Byzantine, a medieval aesthetic. Um, so these are, these are columns and capitals in the style of, of the era of Justinian. The columns are, are more or less copied from the Basilica in Ephesus that Justinian built in the 6th century. Um, the, the chandeliers are in the style of 14th century uh, Serbian metalwork. The iconostasis is, uh, is Russian in style, but in early medieval Russian, not a huge group of iconostases that you'd see in a St. Petersburg church. Um, and so in general, it's, it's, it's giving a medieval aesthetic, an early medieval aesthetic in here. And the iconographer has decided to follow that with the painting, the, the style of this painting, is 10th and 11th century Byzantine style. And another, another cue from Charleston architecture that we decided to really play off is the use of this harpine wood. The iconostasis is salvaged antique harpine, the floor is new, southern yellow pine. Um, and uh, you know, this is a local material. Um, also the antique brick that we used outside is all salvaged Charleston brick. And I think that this makes the building really feel like it, it belongs here. It's rooted to the, to the history of the place. One of, the, one of the things that sets my own work apart from a lot of other Orthodox church architects is trying to make it look locally meaningful and comfortable. A lot of, a lot of Orthodox churches just look like an exact copy of a building picked up off of Mount Athos and dropped in Illinois, and it's, it's uncomfortable. It, just, it, it makes it look like it's uncomfortable for them. Of this building in Ion, because that's quite an interesting story. 
um, when, when, when ION um, was <coughs> laid out zoning wise, um, then some Andres set aside certain lots as uh, civic zone lots that were intended for schools or churches. Um, and Vince went around to local churches to try to encourage them to come and build churches in Ion. And many of them said, that's, that's ridiculous. We would never build a little neighborhood church. You know, a new church would have to have 2,000 parking spaces and an auditorium and so forth, because that's the fashion in the South. Um, well, our church, which had just started a little mission and was meeting in someone's house, heard this story, read it in the newspaper, and came to Vince and said, could, you know, we, we want to build a little neighborhood church. Could we build a, you know, could we get one of these lots and build a little, you know, wooden mushroom village style church out in the woods where nobody would see it, wouldn't bother anybody. And it said, I'd love to have you build in my neighborhood, but I don't want you to build a civic building. I don't want a little wooden building back in the woods, come out onto the corner, we'll give you a corner lot, build a big monument. Um, and he loved the idea of having a monument building so like a Russian church. He thought that would be a, a great feature of the neighborhood. So Vince was very much the driving force behind this building becoming so monumental. Um, and because we couldn't really afford to build it that way, he ultimately gave us the piece of land for free, um, which helped us do that. And this, this brings up something that's very dear to me since I work both in the fields of new urbanism and orthodox architecture, which is that there's a, there's a very natural marriage of the two. Um, the Orthodox Church, more than any other church you could find, is incredibly committed to tradition, um, not just theological and liturgical traditions, but everything about traditional ways of medieval life being revived and practiced as a spiritual discipline. And as a result, Orthodox churches are one of the very few kinds of churches you could find that to this day build uh, small neighborhood parishes that try to function traditionally. Um, and that makes them a, a wonderful fit for new urbanist neighborhoods. Um, and, and there's just a great, there's a great deal of parallel to what we all do in architecture with what the Orthodox Church promotes. Um, the Orthodox Church is, is really committed to traditional medieval architecture um, and to medieval traditional iconography. Um, unfortunately, they don't always get it because there's a lot of modernist architects who try to design Orthodox churches and church leaders don't really know the difference and they see a dome and they think it's Hagia Sophia and they don't know any better. So there's a lot of Orthodox churches that are pretty modern looking, but that's, that's, that's despite the, uh, everybody's best efforts to always try to get a traditional, a traditional building. So how many of the parishioners live in the neighborhood? Actually only one. Yeah, we, we, uh, it was our hope that we would have a lot of people living in the neighborhood, but the neighborhood's very expensive, and the, um, the Orthodox demographic does not tend to be very rich, so most of our people uh, just commute from all over the metropolitan area. Um, but that may change over time. So do you park on the streets? No, it's about that park. Well, yeah, that's a funny story, too. Um, the zoning ordinance states that um, you have to have one parking space for a certain number of pews. <coughs> um, we don't have any pews in the Orthodox Church. So, so then they, they used a different provision of the zoning ordinance for auditorium spaces without fixed seating, which, which gave us a pretty low parking requirement of just 13 spaces. And then in Ion, they allow you to count spaces along your street frontage towards that. Um, and we were just able to do it. So ultimately, we didn't need to have any spaces except the one handicapped spot. Um, which was really nice because we don't really have the land for it. Um, and of course, we, you know, we have far more than 13 cars, but they work all, all up and down Jungle Boulevard and it works very well. Um, well, we'll have, do a little treat for you. Um, we're going to sing some, uh, some Pasco music for you so you can hear the acoustic in here and feel free to look around. We're going to sing the um, Pascal Traparian, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, defeating life, de de defeating death. Um, and we're going to sing a, a very exciting version of it that comes from medieval Georgia.
Yeah, it's a heat. It's a heat pump. It's right, both okay. heat and cool through the floor vents. Right. Yeah. How do you get the rounded edges? Is that just ground off the concrete? Yes, it is. I, I just had the masons take a, a hatchet and knock the corners off all the concrete blocks and just pull the plaster right around it. Yeah. Yeah. It gives. I did that because the the old church's Byzantine plaster is about two inches thick. Um, I'm not sure why, but. But, you know, late Roman construction, they used this huge plaster, sometimes it's four inches thick, and so you get these wonderful rounded corners in Byzantine churches. And we, we use this plaster that's less than a quarter of an inch thick, so I had to, I had to do that to get this Byzantine aesthetic to it. Mm -hmm. How many thick is that? Well, this is three blocks thick. This is ridiculous, 24 inches. So it was a concrete, concrete block? Yeah. Okay. The and the are on the columns is so yeah, so the way, the way we did this, we had a fiberglass bowl that, that George made years ago off of, a, off of an old wooden porch column. Um, and so it's a two-piece fiberglass mold we set up in place, just pumped it full of ordinary concrete. Um, and then these parts I made special molds, a rubber mold for the lower ionic capital and a part wooden mold for the impost block. And we cast those separately and set them up there, again, just ordinary concrete. And then I took um, tile grout and rubbed it all over it to fill in the air bubbles, um, and then and then used uh, wet sandpaper to sand it until it was reasonably smooth, and then about ten coats of linseed oil. Fantastic. No problems with the engineer. No, no, it's it's pretty massive. It's got a cage of three more in it that goes through the capital. It's it's. Is there any pigment, or is it just the linseed oil? No, it's just grey concrete and seed oil, yeah. Amazing. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of elbow grease to, to, to polish it to that extent. <laughs> I have a lot of church clients very interested in columns that look more like stone but aren't. So it's, you know, to get the cost down. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I've actually in my more recent work, I've been exploring just getting real marble columns. Right. Because, with, you know, with with mechanized production, um, getting them either from Italy or from China, right. the, the cost of getting real marble columns is, is actually not, not that bad now. Right. And the problem is, like what Duncan Stroyd ran into, is you, know, you have to core them for these if you have actual structure coming down a lot of places. If they won't big, let you yeah. They won't let you use a column you know, to hold something up, even though you know, the column is just as good as... Yeah, if it's... Building if it's 3,000 years or so. If yeah, oh yeah. If, yeah. It's a, if it's a modest span like this, there's probably a way of doing it just by putting a lintel yeah, across the yeah. top of them to take the weight off of them. But yeah, if it's a, if it's a big basilica where you've got you know, 75 feet of arcade, you can't do that. And the concrete blocks here are made in sort of bourgeois and... Yeah. Make formwork. 
Well, the way I do the, the way I do the big large is it's just um, yeah, make a wooden form and then just lay concrete bricks over them, and then the rest of the course is a block just going into those and our angle cut where they meet it. So it's, it's pretty simple for the masons. Now, one of the things that I've forgotten, but actually, because when I first came to this, when I first saw this church, I said, what an odd, what are you going to do? I'm always trying to give lessons to things. Generally about letting go. <laughs> Could you please not over design? You know, that's the general theme. I right, learned so much from Leo. Yeah. Leo's house. How do you let go? For example, the entrance of the church is completely non-conventional, but extremely successful. You know, and I think in a charrette, it would never have been, it would have been designed with them. Entrance, no. And it was, I was reminded because it used to be much more, much more visible, graph, only graphically in this drawing, where it was wider. You see it, mm -hmm. and on it are the civic, the civic buildings. And commercial. So there isn't, yeah, this is the, the, the non-residential buildings. What happens is that you get this grid, so you're lost, but you're not lost very long. The whole idea is what uh, somebody told me yesterday is that. Uh, Robert o said, Leo says that every city needs to have a Thames, a Thames River. It doesn't matter where it goes, and it can wiggle, it doesn't have to be straight, but it reorients constantly. And I was, as I was looking at this, I've always said, why is the church here? But of course, it's on the Thames. You know, like all this stuff is on the Thames, down to the last club. So it doesn't have to be axial, it doesn't have to be Beaux-Arts, but also it can't be just anywhere. At some point, you, it never, you can never orient yourself. Now, you can never orient yourself to this place for the first three weeks you're here. For sure. And that's, by the way, all the good towns are like that. But after three weeks, everything plays. That's, 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 it's almost perfect. Well, well, too many of the others just reveal themselves instantly, and then they get boring very quickly. I don't know if it makes any difference or not, but the, um, it was also, you know, we, did, we built the neighborhood sequentially in small phases. So this one, otherwise you just blow out the budget. You know, what they're doing now is having everybody build driveways, I mean, alleys with curbs and everything. It's just, you know, the new, new urbanists don't know how to fight. What was, um... This, this actually, we got four types of streets right here. One, two, three. Yeah. We've got a one-way 17-foot-wide street with parking. This is our typical lane, 10 or 11 feet and a 20-foot right away. This is what we call R30, which is a 20-foot uh, pavement and a 30-foot right away. And we had to, this actually acts as a, as a uh, service lane to these houses built on the lake. For our zoning, every house has to have 27 feet minimum of frontage on a approved street. So you see this the problem? one, this one is approved. This one is a private, and then this is 22 feet and a 50 foot right away. So these are four of our five street types. And look at the transect. See how it goes from curb to that's a street too, but it's it's one one more rural notch down. You have Sometimes a, you get oriented just by the street, it's not the building. Because the buildings do whatever they're doing. But you say, I'm going into the countryside now. It's, that's why the horizontal plane is so important. And the civil engineering, the school starts here. Civil engineering has to be co-equal with architecture, not superior. You know, and somebody says that actually 40% of what you see is the horizontal plane. Everybody thinks this is, this is non-existent and everything's that. Sorry, guys, it's 45 degrees. You see both together. So the architects have to cool it, and the engineers have to raise their, in a way, their, their aesthetic their aesthetic feel. Do you eliminate the curb on the alleyways, like, to save money so that you can spend it Partially, elsewhere? but also because they're constantly cut. They have a lot of drop. You, they have to be equivalent. This has to be, this has to be detailed like a driveway. What you're doing is not building the front driveway, you're building the alley instead. The only problem is that the, the, the driveway is built by the private developer, while the, this, the rear lane is built by the master developer, so it looks different in the numbers. You see what I'm saying? This is a, this is a full add to the, to the master developer. Well, if you were to download the driveway, 
If you had driveways in front, that's the other guy. It doesn't cost more, so you have to figure out how to charge more by telling the people you, you don't have to build your driveway. The narrowness precludes really a, a need for a curb. Well, that too, also, you, you, you see right here, you have a sidewalk there with a curb, right? Yeah. That says walk on the sidewalk, don't walk on the street. This says this is, this is open, this is a owner, you know? Well, no, two Not things. Like first, of all, first of all, you don't know where the, when you have, when you build a street in front, you actually force the driveways. You pre-decide where the driveways are for the building type. You also pre-decide the lot width. You basically made a decision too early regarding lot width and driveway. It's a disaster in front. Here you don't, right? You just build a thing in the front, you're fine, you get approved. Here you can actually, you can actually reallocate the lots, continue the lot width, which is why this is so rich. And, and, then, the arch and, then, and then the architect can actually design, decide the house with that thing stuck with the driveway. So th there are incredibly deep implications you can, you can, you to the front. Your, uh, originally, when we did the sh original charrette in 1995, we had 12 different thoroughfare types. And everything you see is a really compromised version of the original vision. And we, we ended up with five. So you know, we did the best with what we could. But uh, it does, to, to the point, too, about the question about the, um, the sidewalks. I mean, you'll see this road type used back toward the marsh. Remember, we wanted a, a less formal type that you people just walk in the street. Because there's not that the much traffic. That's the existed. So all we, we talked about less formal, that we weren't clear about urban to rural. I mean, there was a notion, but right? Yeah. We, we, feel, we think if you, you know, if a dog will feel comfortable sleeping on the street, you build a successful street. <laughs> the so. ideal is that you walk down the middle of the street, not yeah. the sidewalk. You know, it, it, we used to build sidewalks. We have since built fewer and fewer sidewalks <laughs> because we realize people walk down the middle of the street anyway. By the way, one thing I should say, another thing. Look at the, look at the dimensions of this. Because we don't know this is approximately an inch or two less than standard issue. And this is approximately an inch less. And this is probably a, a good uh, 12 inches less. There is, in public works manuals, no distinction between a downtown Chicago infrastructure and a small town. But if you look at Olmsted, if you, go, if you look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Forest Hills, you will see that one of the delights of it is the Olmsted detailing is so much more delicate. It's small town detailing. And in public works manuals, it's always flat out. Like, one of the things that astonishes me is you go to Chicago, downtown Chicago, with the 100-story buildings, and it's exactly the same infrastructure and inlet and width that you, you, they make people build in, in the suburban cul-de-sacs. The place, the public, civil engineering is so dumbed down that it's almost beyond comprehension. But look how delicate this is. And by the way, see the brakes? That's life. In suburbia, my God, the developers <coughs> have to be out here within two minutes. One of the things about, about starting basically sloppy is that you can continue being sloppy without losing sales. You know, dead grass in a suburban subdivision will cost you a sale. So it's better not to even have grass. I mean, why, why cause trouble for yourself? It's hard enough. Just to underscore Anders's point right there, um, and, and before I do, I'd like to introduce Chad Besenfelder. Chad, if you could raise your hand. He's our general manager. And Claire Morris, raise your hand. And Pam Martin, has been with me forever. The glue of our organization is right here. But to underscore Anders's point, this is, this is a fight right here. You have all these little fights, right? We first have to fight with our civil engineers who've been doing things a certain way forever and trying to convince them that this is a better way. They want to pull it out. They want to think. And then we have to fight with the, you know, the permitting authorities to do it. But Chad is an expert at that. I've lost patience with it, but he's well, great. <laughs> just a couple of details about about uh, here also. See this open open catalog, uh, open catalog. This thing can be knocked down. You order another one. It's also real, it's also cheap. Many developers come from suburbia and celebration, everything has to be designed. Cute little signs with a little carriage house signage. Don't do that. It just, there is nothing to be gained. Okay, this can actually tolerate not being screwed in right. And it actually adds rather than subtracts. I can't say enough about that. And one thing about Vince, okay, people, one of the things that may have been noticed is that I have a difficult personality. 
Not no. as difficult. Not as difficult as Liberados, for example. <laughs> no. But he, he's basically on the right track, and this is what happens when people come and meet me. Okay, it's like actually joining the Marine Corps. Okay. <laughs> People say, your towns are so much better than anybody else's town, okay? It's because you talk better. No, it's because I'm more of a son of a bitch, okay? What happens is the guys that aren't gonna do it, leave and go get, you know, fill in your name. But you're our son of a bitch. No, I am a, that's what I'm saying. I am a son of a bitch. Uh, because I am a son of a bitch, I get the elite developers. Now he, first by putting up with me, then puts up with every single damn traffic engineer, public works manual. You know, he took this thing to the Supreme Court to get it permitted to the, to the, to the state Supreme Court. Okay. The other guys immediately wimp out. Immediately wimp out. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a big difference. Our, you know, our I do think our towns are categorically better because our developers are categorically better. This is a constant personality type. Vince, I mean, you're... Well, you're very generous. Um, I, don't, I think Pam and Chad and Claire might beg to differ about me not being a son of a bitch. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. Son of a bitches recognize each other. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I can do that. I'm a Marine, you know? You know, you just, you, you, I always say, go join the Coast Guard. I mean, it's something nice. I don't know. But you don't have to be so delightful. But we lose a lot of work. <laughs> we lose a lot of work, but the work that we do get, you know, tends to be much better because the developers do better. Can you talk a little bit about the Supreme Court case? Who's talking now? The Supreme Court case? Yeah. Um, well, and it's a long story, but I'll try to summarize. We, uh, so we originally had the charrette 20 years ago next month and we came up with this plan for 1240 homes including a lot of multifamily. if you look on the second page you'll see a lot of the late great charles barrett's um renderings that we did for the multifamily. Um, townhouses apartment buildings. we uh we were we were um following along the lines of the town of mount pleasant's master plan they have this uh written master plan that talks about the virtues of traditional neighborhood development but the zoning was not consistent with the master plan. So we had to go in and file for a rezoning. And in the process, we ended up losing the first, uh, the first, but we had a lot of opposition. We had a lot of um, support, but we had a lot of opposition from the adjacent neighborhood. And we got voted down five to four, and then we waited a year, which was the minimum time that you could to reapply for zoning. And the, uh, we had made a lot of compromises that I've talked about took out the multifamily, unfortunately, reduced the amount of commercial square footage, reduced the number of thoroughfares, just compromised plan to get it approved. And that got approved in um, 2007, in March of 2007. We started building, the opponents filed a, or they gathered up a petition to hold a referendum on our zoning. And the law at the time in South Carolina was unclear on whether or not you could have a referenda on zoning initiative. Um, virtually every state does not allow that. And we had been through the process, we thought fair and square. So that, anyway, we sued the town to prohibit that referendum. Um, and we also had to work to try to win the referendum if it came to that. So we were in the middle of this political campaign to win it two weeks before the referendum. <coughs> was to be held, the, the circuit court judge ruled that no, you can't have a, a referendum on zoning in South Carolina. The opponents then appealed that, um, and it went to the state Supreme Court, and a couple years later, um, they, they uh, ruled in favor of the, unanimously in favor of the circuit court decision. And in the meantime, all the council members who had voted to support ION got, were targeted for defeat and got voted out of office. So we had to build this with a hostile political environment. And the, the lead opponent was actually, as a political appointment, um, was appointed to the planning commission at the time and rose to the chair of the planning commission. He was the guy who said it could never be done. Ultimately, they, he and his companion moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> so uh, it just wow. the circus around us is amazing, yeah, wow. and it and continues. He's, he's More rejoicing in heaven for the sin of repentance. By the way, I have to go meet the students. <laughs> Continue on the tour, please. Okay. Uh, you know, with Vince, so I don't think there's any time to leave until he has to do his next project. But 
Uh, I have to meet some students now. So I may see you. All right. Well, well. Uh huh. This is uh, built in 1998. So. Didn't you have a plaque for burnt out? But anyway, this was a, this was a house, um, three bedroom, two bath, sold for one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Now it can sell for about nine hundred thousand. Um, this is it was sold to a Baptist minister and his wife, and it had a this this street is Soul Street, and this cross street is Gray Street. So we gave him a Gray Street address, changed the address, so he lives. Gray Street address. So, so how was this determined to be the the first house in the first section? Well, we um, we purchased the land. It was my father and brother and I, or youngest brother and I, are the partners, and we bought the land just like we developed it in phases. We also bought it in phases. So this was the first phase that we developed. You didn't have to fight some of those battles until later on. Now, we had fought the battle to get the zoning approval, but as we were building this, the case was winding its way up to the Supreme Court. We didn't know if we were going to be able to do any more phases. So, so we're, yeah, we're right um, here. Yeah, we had a contract, with a, a, kind of a rolling option contract, so we took down a small piece of property each year that, to keep the option alive. So was this the housing stock you expected to do throughout, or were you putting this on the market first to build the value of the larger product later, or was there a... Well, we had no idea that, I mean, you know, we, we started in 1998 before the craziness began. We had no idea people would build what they built. Right. So this was more of, you know, this, these kind of things, this kind of modest, that's what we expected. To do what we expected. These around here, we'll walk around the block and go down the first street, but this is yeah. kind of... So there wasn't a real strategy to we'll get more, we'll lay the I mean, groundwork here for it to build, because these must be, you know, obviously a million plus if this is 900 now. Yeah, so. yeah I mean, some of them close to 2 million in the future, but this was, right. uh, this was what we thought we were going to be able to do. Right. We didn't want to... You know, it's as simple as it can be, right? It's just a right, simple it's box. Straight, doable. Yeah. But it has the, you know, it's good materials. And right. So did the market react? Like, oh, gee, it's a, no front yard or no side yard? Or how did they? I mean, you know, people self-select. Um, but a lot of people, they were familiar with downtown Charleston, the old village in Mount Pleasant. I had done some projects in Beaufort that they had seen. Right. So they got so, it right away. Yeah. Or the people that wanted some to Some people did. Right. But they were still pretty pioneering, right? I mean, they were. Know, yeah, back then. Right. So, and you remember how Andres was talking about in one of his lectures about the Leon Creer's lecture about Corbu, how Corbu or Leon had <laughs> softened the urbanism and made it a little less rigid. <laughs> well, one of the things we do is rather than the side lot lines being perpendicular with the front, we will cant those just a few degrees. So you have you create these little triangular yards, you see. Yeah. And it uh, works particularly well. I think it's less forgiving to the architecture. Um, it doesn't have to be quite on as much. It's just my personal view. But it also, particularly when you have front porches and you do that, the porches aren't looking directly under the next person's porch. So it's a subtle kind of privacy thing. You, know, you see that a lot in downtown. Like I don't know. It's, it's probably not deliberate. We did it deliberately. Well, you have a curved road here, so it's... Brought up the idea. Yeah, you, don't you can have do both. So you can make you can mix up, mix it up. Can't the street. Yeah. Yeah.